All right, good morning. Uh, wanted to mention to you that on the back table, uh, there's uh, Kim and I have written 16 books and booklets, and all of them deal with issues that people face in their lives. And uh, we use them in our counseling at Hope Biblical Counseling Center. Hope Biblical Counseling Center is a place of compassion. And uh, Kim and I have been doing this for uh, over 30 years. And uh, we, don't, I, we don't have to look for people to counsel. Uh, we, ha we receive uh, multiple inquiries uh, weekly uh, for people asking for help. And uh, I believe that uh, as we try to help people, we've been able to see some miraculous change take place in people's lives. From here, we head to Great Falls, Montana, uh, where uh, we're going to be with Pastor Arthur Hernandez and hold the Hope Baptist National Biblical Counseling Training Conference. This will be our 10th one to do someplace in the world. And we've had people attend from 17 foreign countries, including Israel. And so uh, we're very thankful for the opportunity to have that. A little story in respect to uh, Great Falls, Montana. A pastor had mentioned this, in, uh, and, I, and I'll incorporate into that my, uh, my salvation testimony as well. Uh, I grew up in a dysfunctional home. Uh, I could say to you that my parents weren't good people. And it was a very difficult growing up experience. And uh, so we had a park across the street from the house. And there was, uh, you know, the, we played baseball, basketball, and football over there. And uh, because I didn't want to go home at night, because I didn't want to hear all of the wickedness and everything that went on, uh, I would stay out and play ball uh, every night until after dark, and whoever was there, I would play ball with. Um, and so I got, I got really good at playing baseball and um, played against the older boys and got better and continued to get better. And in 1973, uh, I was the 78th player taken in the free agent Major League Baseball draft by the San Francisco Giants. And so uh, I signed a contract with the Giants and uh, uh, came home in the off season. And a United Parcel Service driver named Brick Bratcher uh, talked to me about Jesus Christ just out on his route. And he came by every day for seven months and took his lunch hour and talked to me about Jesus Christ and about my need to be saved. On November 4th, 1974, I bowed my head in uh, Rick Bratcher's family room and uh, asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and be my Savior. And that changed my life. The giant, I told the Giants I was not going to play anymore. They thought I was nuts. And I told them that I'm, I'm a Christian. I got saved and you all play on Sunday. And Sunday's the Lord's day, and I need to be in the Lord's house. And I knew, I knew immediately that my athletic scenario was, or my vocation, was going to be in conflict with my Christian life. And so uh, I uh, uh, did not play any longer, and have not. And uh, 20 years later, they gave me my unconditional release. And so at that point, I think they thought that I was too old to play anymore. So, you know, I wouldn't be able to uh, do that. But um, uh, recently, uh, just for the purpose of all of this, um, got a phone call and uh, my wife said, you're going to want to get this call. And uh, so got inducted into the Indiana High School Sports Hall of Fame. And so uh, in 1973, I became the best baseball player in Indiana. And, uh, you know, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, that was interesting, to say the least. But my whole purpose in saying that to you is this. I grew up in a very difficult circumstances. Now, I love my parents. And uh, I'm not blaming them for anything that happened. I can say this, 
God allowed me to lead my parents to the Lord. And I've led my grandparents to the Lord. I led my wife's parents to the Lord. And I led her grandparents to the Lord. And so by just a United Parcel Service driver out on his route, trying to witness to people, I got saved. And others now have, you know, many, many people have gotten saved, and we've been able to help a lot of people, and we're thankful to God for that. You know, the reason why I share some of that with you is because I want you to understand that even if you have grown up in difficult circumstances, God can change your life. Even if, there's a, even if there's a problem in your life right now, God can help you with that. And you may be here this morning and you may be facing uh, some kind of difficulty. And that's why we're here. All of us face difficulties. And I am so thankful to be saved today. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ saved me, changed my life and gave me an opportunity to be able to help others. And so uh, Hope Biblical Counseling Center is a place that we uh, spend, uh, you know, people come in, they're, uh, they're in for 13 weeks, and we spend 13 weeks with them, and we share with them how to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God. We share with them how to deal with bitterness and hurt and the fractured relationships. I want to tell you that 99% of our counseling is dealing with fractured relationships. Okay? Now people are going to have those. You're, because as Pastor said, all of you have relationships. Now some of those relationships, I, I want to say to you this, and, and I want you to understand this, and then we're going to look at God's Word. Some of those relationships may not be able to be put back together. But how you handle that relationship that you can't put back together is going to be very important for you. Many relations, relationships can be put back together. And I want to share something else with you when we get started here this morning to realize this. Two things. Number one, Kim and I don't have any magic wands. We're not going to be able to take a wand, slap you in the head, and make you super Christian. Doesn't happen that way. Secondly, uh, something that I have learned is, is that you can't make a decision for anybody else. They're going to make their own decisions. And if you understand that, you know, when you realize that everybody's got a free will and people are going to make their own choices... Now, it's very important for us to understand that. Now, you know, I can see God work in people's lives to make change, and I'm going to help you with some of that this week. But I just want you to realize that everybody's going to make their own choices, right? Amen. And you're not going to be able to make a choice for them, and they're going to be responsible for their own choices. So let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Do you realize that the Bible tells us that if you use your spiritual gifts in the body of Christ, that you're going to get hurt? Do you know that? Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you to think with me. How many of you have been hurt in your life? Probably everybody in here, right? At some point. Now, in thinking about that, recognize that God's... What we do in the counseling is give people tools. You know, when we first got married... Kim bought me a toolbox, a craftsman toolbox. And I thought, you know, I wonder why she did that. Now, in our house, she's mechanically inclined. I read the instructions. 
Okay, me and a hammer, not even close to being friends. Okay, but she, you know, she can take it and put it right together. And I can sit there and say, well, that goes here, that does that. But if I try to put it together, I have to pray. <laughs> and I find that just letting somebody else who handles that ability do it relieves a lot of frustration in my life. Amen? All right, let's take our Bibles in Psalm 37. I want to talk to you this morning about for those who hurt. For those who hurt within the scope of fractured relationships. If you stand with me out of respect to God and His Word, for those who hurt in respect to fractured relationships, Psalm 37 and verse 1 says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they soon shall be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Let's begin by having a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to open your word, and we pray that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher. I submit myself to you now. I pray, God, that my mind, my heart will be yours. I pray through the next few minutes that you'll work in hearts and lives. I pray for your power. I pray for your presence. I pray for anybody here who is uh, not saved today, that they will come to a saving knowledge of you, that they'll realize the need to trust you as Savior and turn from their sins and turn from themselves and ask you to come into your heart and be their Savior. And, and Father, I pray also today for the person who may be here who's out of fellowship with you. I pray, God, that you'll work in their heart today and help them to realize that their fellowship with you is something that's extremely important. And God, we pray for your help for that. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, the moment you got saved, the moment you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Savior, the Holy Spirit came to indwell you. Now, at that moment, the Holy Spirit is there to do at least 70 different things in your life. Now, we can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit by sin and be out of what the Bible says is out of fellowship with God. It doesn't mean that we're not saved and we're not going to go to heaven. What it does mean is we have a problem within our relationship with God. Okay? Think about it like this. When you have a problem in a relationship, you know, you can't talk like you normally would. And with God, when you're out of fellowship with Him, you can't talk like you normally would. You know? The Bible says in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And the word iniquity means sin. One of the things that, that I find in our counseling situation is, is that many Christians, since they got saved, they believe that's it. Okay, I'm saved now, I'm going to heaven. No, that's not it. That's just the place you start. Amen? Amen. It's just the place you start. It's not the place you stop. And God wants you to grow. He wants you to learn. He wants you to be more like Jesus Christ. But because of our lusts, and the Bible tells us there's at least 82 different lusts that a Christian can have. 82. Now, when we speak about lust, most people think moral. Okay, well, that's one. So there's 81 others. And so one of the things that we do with people is we seek to find out what lusts are in their life and deal with them biblically. Let me see if I can put it to you like this. You know, now that we have, we have COVID, uh, we don't, you know, before we would bring people to Little Rock and we would meet with them and spend four days with them. Pastors, missionaries, evangelists, lay people from all over the world. But now we can't do that because of COVID. 
And so we do it on the phone so I don't get to see the halo data. And what I mean by that is, is that we're talking to a married couple and I say, all right, John, what about this? Did you do that? And he says no, and the wife goes, <sighs> that's halo data. Got it? Now, I've had people come in for counseling, and, you know, uh, I, used to, I had a love seat in my office. And that love seat was there because they needed to sit beside each other in the love seat. And I've had men say, you mean I got to sit by her? Seriously? If I knew how to do that, I wouldn't have came. And I said, well, did you tell her you loved her when you married her? Well, sure. Well, then sit down. It's the only seat in the house. Now, I want you to understand, I want you to understand that your fellowship with God is extremely important. And if they're, see, so let me see if I can do like this. And I do this on the phone with people. I say, all right, now I got both hands up. Visualize it. So the person's telling me that the problem is over here. Okay? Well, the problem is probably not over here. The problem is over here with a lust that's driving this behavior over here. Y'all with me? Or not? Okay, so what's happening is over here is driving this demand lust over here. Ephesians 2, 3, a desire of the mind. So within relationships, first of all, if I'm going to have a good relationship with others, I've got to have a good relationship with God. Y'all with me? Okay. I have to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God. That there's nothing standing between Him and me. So we teach our counselees that every day to have a real relationship with God, you need to ask God a question. Now listen to me carefully. The essence of the Christian life is to ask God questions. Okay? The essence of the Christian life is to ask God questions. That's submission. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So here's a question in, in, in my relationships. Here's my question. Here's my relationship with God. I'm not going to have good relationships with anybody else if I don't have a good relationship with God. Amen? It's not going to work. God, is there any sin that stands between you and me? I want you to show that to me now. Now, how many of you take a shower every day? Well, you, none of you? <laughs> what? Stinking up the place, right? <laughs> Guess what? If you didn't take a shower, you know, a couple days out, you know, your wife's going to say to you, have you taken a shower yet? You know, those clothes you wear smell. You wives ever said that? No? My wife has said to me, don't you come into those house, this house now with those clothes on. You've been working out in the yard. You know, they got junk all over them. And I just, I just vacuumed and don't be, don't be messing with the floor now. Listen, just like you would... Take a shower just like you would change your clothes from dirty clothes to clean clothes. You're going to have to ask God to show you if there's any sin that stands between you and Him. Every day. Why? 
Because 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and listen, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So many people as, as, who get saved, they just go through their life and they never understand and never get that they've got to deal with their sin on a daily basis. So, tool. If I ask God, is there any sin that stands between you and me, and He shows it to me, and I confess it to Him, is He going to cleanse me? Is He going to forgive me? Yeah, he said he would. Now, tell me your name. Pam. Pam. I remember you, you know, okay? <laughs> Somehow, okay? I, we see so many people, I just, you know, and I normally pick on somebody to help me. Okay, Pam, ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. So Pam asked God to show her if any sins in her life and she, and she asks, and he says, this one. And so she asks God to forgive her. 24 hours later, Pam, you're doing it again. Shameful, isn't it? Yes. And so she's doing it again. And so she comes back the next day and she says, God, I want you to forgive me for that sin. And 24 hours later, guess what? Pam's doing it again. Now that is what the Bible calls a demand lust and it's controlling behavior. So there are things that, uh, a sin in my life that I can ask God for forgiveness for and I can walk away from it and not have a problem. But if it comes up more than three times pretty quickly, that means it's a demand lust and it's controlling behavior. So I'm telling you, you've got to know where your lusts are to be able to deal with them so you can have proper relationships. <clears throat> now, when you're dealing with that and, the, and when you're dealing with that, what happens is, is that now you understand that this is a problem for me. This is a problem for me. And now I've got to find out exactly what God's Word says about that area. Not what I think it says, but exactly what it says. So what we do is we go and say, All right, Pam, we now know you've got this problem. So what I want you to do, Pam, is I want you to take your Bible and I want you to find five verses that deal with this subject. Then I want you to write down two things that you learn from that each verse. Because we're not here just for conformity, we're here for transformation. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And listen, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, changed, by the renewing of your mind. So Pam's thinking on this subject has to change from what she wants to do over here to what God says over here. Amen? Amen. You got it? So it's very important then every day that I ask God to show me my sins so that I can be in fellowship with Him. <clears throat> Because no relationships are going to work well if I don't have a real relationship with Him. Now, you're, are you all with me? You hearing me? You understand? This is extremely important. Now, so Pam goes out and she goes to work. Do you work, Pam? Okay. And her boss comes in today and he, or she, whoever it is, is not being nice. 
You ever have a boss like that? And he or she says something that hurts you. And they'll say something like, you know what? I really wish you would get on that and get that done because I constantly have to tell you to get your work done. And immediately in your mind, you may not say it, but who does he think he is? Talking to me like that. Well, let's see what the Bible says about who he is. Okay? And how to deal with him. Look with me at Psalm 37 for a minute. Now let's, let's, let's think about this. And I want you to look with me at verse 1. Now watch. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thy envious against the workers of iniquity. What is the first word in this verse, folks? I can't hear you. Fret. Fret. Anybody done any fretting this week? Come on. You done any fretting this week? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in our community, Kim, what's the name of that street? Yeah, we were out on vis or some folks of our church were out on visitation. They sent me back a picture, and the sign on the street said it was Dunn Fretton Street. How'd you like to live on that one? What street do you live on, Dunn Fretton? Now, watch what it says here it says, Fret not thyself. The Bible has a flesh cycle that people go through. And it all starts with fretting. Something, somebody says something to you. Somebody does something to you. Or, you know, the devil's really good if you have not dealt with your fellowship with God. Listen to me carefully. You've now left a portal open for Satan to deal with your mind. Man's a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit. Let me see if I can get this across now. Satan works from the outside in. God works from the inside out. His spirit speaking to our spirit. Satan's desire is to control your soul, which is the seat of your emotions, so that he can control your decision-making. Now, one of the things, what we try to do here is we try to turn people from being emotion-led people to being spirit-controlled people. Got me? Y'all with me here now? We're trying to turn people from being emotion-led people to being spirit-controlled people. The first thing that happens for the flesh cycle and not being a spirit-controlled person. Let me point this out to you. There is no other option in the room but be a spirit-controlled person. Otherwise, your relationships are going to go down the tube. There is no other option in the room rather than, other than be a spirit-controlled person. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled or controlled with the Spirit. Do you know what verse 17 says there? Be not unwise, but knowing what the will of the Lord is. To be a Spirit-controlled person. So an unwise person is a person who knowledgeably chooses not to be a spirit-controlled person or ignorantly chooses not to be a spirit-controlled person. Okay? Most of the people that we counsel who are members of independent Baptist churches have no clue about what it means to be a spirit-controlled person. None. 
And the reality of it is, is that that plays over into their relationships with their children. It plays over into their relationship with their wife. It plays over into their relationship with their husband. We deal with a lot of people who contact us because their child just turned 18 or 17. And the child now is saying, I don't want to live for God. And the parents say, well, I didn't see that one coming. And the reason why we didn't see it coming is because little Billy or little Susie or little Tommy was never taught what it meant to be a spirit-controlled person. And so by the time they get to be 18, they're now inwardly a rebellious person and they're going to make choices that they want to make rather than understanding being a spirit-controlled person. Now... So the first step in not being a spirit control person, and later here in this week we're going to talk about how to be a spirit control person, but the first step in not being a spirit control person is fretting. Fret not thyself because of who? What's the Bible say here? Evildoers. Number two. <laughs> Be not thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Envious? Envious? Think about it like this, Pam. Your boss. Is your boss a, a man or a woman? A lady. a lady. Good. A lady. I like it. All right. So the lady, does she treat you well? Sometimes, all right. Well, on those days that she doesn't, think about this. Envy. Envy has a lot of arms going off of it. And so, you know, we think about the fact of who in the world does she think she is? I bet she doesn't talk to other people. She doesn't talk to Susie that way. And we become envious of the relationship of other people. Got it? Fret, and by, so the flesh cycle is this. Fret, envy, anger, wrath, evil cycle. Every one of you have went up that cycle at some point. Now watch. Verse 8. Okay, verse 2, fret not, and what? Be not envious. And as we keep climbing up in this cycle, verse 8 says, cease from what? Anger. So now you went from fret, envy, anger. You know what the next one is? Wrath. Wrath is anger with a strong desire to avenge. I don't know how many times I've had a young person or even an adult sit in my office and say, I hate my dad. Or I hate my mom. So how do we get from here to here? You know? You know, the Bible says that a father's not to provoke his children to wrath. So if I'm a non-spirit controlled person, and anger, by the way, is the hidden sin of independent Baptists. So if I'm not a spirit controlled person, and I deal with my children in anger... I'm going to provoke them to what? Wrath.
So when that relationship gets to provoking to wrath, we got a major problem going on, right? Because anger is a strong desire to avenge. So here, now, by the way, do you think that when anger is used in a relationship that we've got a good relationship here? What do you think? No. Let's see what the Bible says here just about anger for a second, okay? Now, I, wanna, I want you to turn back to Ephesians 4. <clears throat> All right. We've already worked on Pam a little bit. Now she's in better shape, all right? Okay. Right behind Pam, the gentleman right there. What's your name? John. John, you want to help me? Sure. All right, here we go. It says in verse 31. Now, everybody watch closely what God's Word says. The first word there is what? You with me? What's the first word? Let. let. It means somebody's got to make a decision. Anytime you see the word let at the start of a verse, it means somebody's got to make a decision. So notice what it says here, John. Let all what? Bitterness. Bitterness. You see this list here? Bitterness. And wrath and anger and clamor, which means public quarreling. And evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. Now, let me ask you a question, John. What, pro what, what part of, prob of all do we have a problem with? <laughs> That's right. It says there, let all. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. Be put away from you. Not somebody else, but who? You. Be put away from you. All anger. All wrath. Now, listen carefully to me. Why do you think bitterness is used first here? It's a root sin. And all the rest of this garbage comes off of it. So let me give you another question to ask God. Not only do I want to ask God every day, is there any sin in my life? I want to ask God to show me if there's any bitterness in my life. To a person or a circumstance. Because here it says it's supposed to be put away from you. Everybody we counsel has bitterness. Everybody. And that's the reason why they're an anger monger. That's the reason why they say hurtful and mean things. That's the reason why they handle themselves disrespectfully with people who have authority over them. Now, the Bible says here, let all be put away from you. Didn't say some. All. Now, you know, in Jeremiah 17, the Bible says that our heart is desperately wicked and who can know it? And it says, I, God, search the heart. So I'm going to ask God, John, to search my heart every day. Show me if there's any bitterness in my heart toward anyone or any situation. Otherwise, I'm not going to have fellowship with God and I'm going to act like this. And you know what I call these, these six things here in Ephesians 4.31? Slime. The slimy sixth. Because if all these things are in your life, you know what? If all these things are in your life, you're going to be a malicious person. And your relationships are going to go down the tube. 
And you're not going to have good relationships. You're not going to have good relationships in your home. You're not going to have good relationships at work. You're not going to have good relationships in every part of your life because of the fact that you have bitterness in your heart towards someone or something. Now, turn back to Hebrews chapter 12 with me and look at verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. Now, we're talking about dealing with hurt, okay? Now, we're getting the, the reasons why right now. Tonight, we're going to get, how am I going to change that? And how am I going to make it real in my life? Now, notice what it says here in, in Hebrews 12 and look at verse 15. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, notice first two words here, John. Looking what? Diligently. At who? Myself. Yes. Diligently. So what's that mean, John? Yes, that means that, you know, this is not sloppy work here. It has to be done diligently. And I have to be focused on seeing it. Looking diligently at me. Why? Because if I don't look diligently at me and ask God to search my heart, I'm going to fail of the grace of God. I'm going to be out here walking on my own. I'm not going to have God's power in my life. And everything I'm going to touch, I'm going to mess up. Really? Now watch. Lest any root of bitterness... Springing up, trouble who? Trouble who? And thereby many be what? Defiled. So, is it possible for you because of bitterness to defile your wife? Yes or no? Is it possible for you as a wife to defile your husband because of bitterness? Is it possible for you as parents to defy, defile your children because of bitterness? Now remember, we're talking about fractured relationships here. And so when people get it, fractured relationships is because they've not spirit-controlled people, they're not asking God the right questions, and they're not moving forward in their Christian life. They're not dealing with their sin, they're not in fellowship with God, they have bitterness in their heart, and they're blowing it when they don't have to. So, notice it says, root of bitterness. And thereby many be found. It's just like dandelions. Y'all have dandelions around here? Okay, you go out and mow those dandelions, what happens? Two days later, they're right back up, right? Same way with bitterness. So you've got to get it out by the root. So listen to me carefully here. Remember God searching the heart? God's all powerful. Lord, I want you to take this root of bitterness out of my heart. I want him to show it to me and then want to ask him to take it out. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
Remember, our heart, even though we're saved because of our old nature, is desperately wicked. And I tell people this. You have to learn to take control of your dark side rather than let it control you. So as a believer, there are people out here that allow their dark side to control them every day. They don't even have a clue how to deal with it, and they don't even want to, so they live for their lust. They live like lost people. A lost person lives like this. They go from this lust to this lust to this lust to this lust, and the reason why they're not committing this lust is because they're distracted by this one. And Christians can live the same way they live like a lost person because they're not using the tools that God has given them to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with Him. Therefore, they don't have a good relationship with their wife. They don't have a good relationship with their husband. They don't have a good relationship with their children or the children a relationship with them. Are you all with me? You understand? Eighty percent of all children that grow up in a Christian home do not go on to serve God. And by the way, that's an independent Baptist statistic. That's that's horrible. We would much rather have the kids over at the church playing games, taking them to the mall, go to Six Flags, or I don't know what you got around here, some amusement park, and yippy yappy and yahooey, and we grow up and live like the devil. Yet we were members of this church, and yet we have lived our life this way. You say, well, what you're talking about, Dr. Coomer, is... Work. Well, yes. But how much work does it take to ask God the question every day, is there any sin in my life? You might sit in front of the TV for two or three hours a day. You might spend three or four hours a day on social media. But how long is it going to take to ask God, is there any sin in my life? Thank you. Good answer. Now, it may take a little bit longer when God shows, keeps showing you sin that's in your life. You know, most of our counselees at the start, they're like, oh, man, i got to deal with this and this and this and this. Well, you haven't been dealing with it. You've been stinking up the place. But now you've got to deal with it spiritually. Well, I'm out of time. So the next hour, we're going to move on to something that's really cool. Now, we are all about practical Christianity here. Making Jesus Christ real in your life, and especially at the point of impact in your life. You're going to have points of impact every day. What do you do? Do you just fret and get angry? And, you know, fret, envy, anger, wrath, evil. How many of you come home and unload on your wife about how bad work was today? How many of you unload on your husband about how bad the kids were today? How many of you unload on each other just because everything's bad? <laughs> now listen. You have to understand that God provides you tools and you got to learn how to use them. And you got to make sure you do. Or otherwise you're going to have relationships that are going to be bad news. And you may be sitting here this morning and you say, well, you know, I hear you, but I don't really give a rip. Well, you're going to give a rip five years down the road when your life is in a major mess. 
and you don't know what to do. By the way, train up a child in the way he should go, not his own way, but the way he should go. Teach him how to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God, and when he's old, leaves the home, he won't depart. <laughs>